Well, welcome to part three of our little class here called Exploring the Faith. So we're looking at the worldview, uh, kind of laying the foundations of uh, the Christian faith. Uh, we've talked about God's law in part two, and today we're going to come back with God's gospel, the good news. Uh, he doesn't leave us accused of the law, uh, but he reminds us that it's all about Jesus. So this is lesson nine. If you've printed out the workbook, uh, the uh, fill in the blank sheets uh, that go along with this class. Uh, number one, the gospel, what is it? Well, if you wanna fill in the blanks here, God's free gift to us of forgiveness, eternal life and salvation in and through Jesus Christ. That is really uh, as simple as it gets because the word gospel literally means good news. You know what news is? You see news on uh, your news feed, right? Uh, usually it's bad news though, uh, but this is good news and it's the best good news. It's the goodest news. I know that's not a real word. I'm just a professional communicator. So just getting the point across. The goodest news is God has a free gift for you and it is forgiveness and eternal life uh, in and through uh, because of Jesus Christ and what he did. It is God's work of, next blank, salvation. God's work of salvation for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is the good news. This is what God has done for us. God has sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. And he rose Jesus from the dead three days later uh, to show his power over death and hell and the devil and sin and everything else in all creation, uh, freeing us uh, to make us right with him again. Of course, you know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Right? He sent that one and only Son. Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, the gospel is this free gift, and this is so fundamental in our Christian worldview, uh, that God has done everything necessary for our forgiveness for our salvation, for our eternal life. Uh, God has accomplished it all, every bit. We were not capable of doing it. Remember, uh, we finished the section on the law, uh, how when we look at God's law and what he actually demands of us, it is overwhelming. We realize we cannot live a perfect life uh, to the, be completely acceptable uh, to God's standards. So. He knew our condition and he came down and he saved us. Uh, number two, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, people are justified. That's another theological term that we say a lot without pausing to define. Uh, but justification, uh, it has a kind of a courtroom uh, sense to it. Uh, but it's not like we use the word justify today when we do something wrong or we make a mistake, uh, we uh, maybe on purpose do something wrong, you know, we can try to justify our actions. Well, that basically means we're trying to make an excuse. Uh, that's not what this word means. Uh, this means like a judge says you are innocent and declares you innocent and you are completely, and all charges are dropped, uh, there's no punishment. Uh, so God uh, justifies us. We are justified um, through, through Christ. Uh, and then there's that judge language again. God declares and thus makes us righteous on account of his grace for Jesus' sake. Uh, God's word is performative. When God declares us to be justified, righteous, forgiven, boom, it happens. God's word is powerful. Uh, giving us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And this is received by grace. And that word grace, again, we use it a lot. Do we ever pause to really think about what it means? Uh, 
literally, kind of the Latin theological term there is the favor dei, the favor of God, uh, at God's pleasure. Okay, we are forgiven, we're adopted as his children at his pleasure. That's who he is, this loving, uh, giving, forgiving, uh, gracious being. Uh, there's another definition that we sometimes use in uh, maybe middle school or high school classes when we talk about grace, and it's the acronym for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's what it is. Uh, we receive all the blessings of God because of the price that Jesus paid for us. All right, let's go to number three. So that means it's all about Jesus because we're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. Praise be to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the wonderful news of the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith. And uh, faith, uh, it's another word again uh, in the church language we use a lot. Uh, faith is the, think of it as the open hand that receives the gift uh, of grace, of forgiveness. Uh, God gives us even that hand, that open hand of faith. He gives us that to be able to receive his free gift of grace. I mean, it's all God's work, every piece of it. All right, Roman number two, the gospel, how we know it. Now, remember when we talked about the law, how do we know what God's law is? Well, two ways. There's the natural revelation, uh, common sense of morality, sense of right and wrong that all people have in our hearts, a conscience that accuses us, um, that little voice in your head people talk about sometimes, uh, or a specific revelation, which is where God has specifically said, these are the Ten Commandments. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's how we know the law. When it comes to the gospel, it's only specific revelation. In other words, uh, the fill in the blank is, it is revealed only in God's word. Uh, there's not any natural born understanding of uh, God's grace. It is all through the word of God that we learn about his love for us. So how important is it to follow Jesus's commission to go into all the world, preach the gospel? And number three, the gospel, uh, talking about the power of the gospel here. God's word, both law and gospel, is living. The triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in and through it, the gospel, even now. God's word does what it says. We've talked about that already. And then so, when God, through his word, says you are forgiven, guess what? You're forgiven. Uh, it's the power of God's word that accomplishes that fact. And so what a joy it is to hear our pastor say that on Sunday morning, that you are forgiven because of Jesus Christ. All right, now the next lesson, a little bit of a shift here in, in topics, obviously. Lesson 10, we're talking about confessing the name of God. God introduces himself and reveals his name in the Old Testament. And this is uh, Exodus chapter three. I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, but this is Moses. He's uh, escaped. He's run away, I guess, from Egypt in fear. He's living in the desert. And God wants to call Moses for a very special job that he wants him to do. And he calls him by appearing to him in a burning bush and speaking to him. And uh, Moses asks, well, if I go and do this thing you want me to do, which is go to the Israels in Egypt to free him, uh, who am I going to say sent me? And God says, you tell them, I am sent to you. This is verse 14 of uh, Exodus chapter 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And it's probably all capitalized in, in your Bibles and your translations uh, because that's the uh, very, like the proper name of God. Like my name is Mark. Uh, in the Hebrew, it is called, it would be pronounced Yahweh. Uh, Jehovah is a, 
a, a word that's used a lot in our music and things. That's a kind of a Latinized version of the name. There are no J's in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, it's just the Y, the Yahweh, Yahweh. Uh, very, you know, obviously very specifically, uh, Yahweh. <clears throat> so to fill in the blank here, God's name is revealed to Moses as I am. And that is, there's so much there, right? First of all, that's the uh, first person present singular of the verb to be. And that is the most irregular verb in every language. Uh, but it, it simply means to be, to exist, right? Uh, the creator, the omnipotent, the, the, uh, the supreme being, however people think of it, is the existing one, the one who always was, is, and ever will be. Amen, amen. Uh, he is also who, uh, you know, he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Uh, he, he defines reality, even. God simply is. Uh, that's what defines him as God. But what I think is really significant and really cool about this event, uh, when God comes to Moses, uh, what does it mean when you know someone's name? Like if you just bump into somebody on the street and, oh, excuse me, hey, how you doing? You keep walking. Versus uh, maybe you bump into somebody you know. Uh, oh, hey, John. Oh, hey, Mark. How are you doing? What does that mean when you know someone's name? It means you have a relationship with them. And so here is the supreme being, Yahweh, coming down. And this is Exodus. So the second, this is like the beginning of the whole Bible. You got Genesis, Exodus, chapter 3. God comes down to Moses and he says, hello, I'm Yahweh. He wants to have a relationship with these humans. Sinful, sinful as we are, he loves us dearly. We were created to be in relationship with him. And he no doubt uh, misses that uh, perfection uh, that was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, walking with God in the garden in the cool of the day. What an awesome a relationship. What a, what a wonderful time that must have been. Uh, and so God is constantly, he's reaching out to us, wanting us to have a relationship with him. And I'll just put this right here. How can you have a relationship with someone, anyone, who you never talked to? That's really hard. As a matter of fact, most friends kind of part ways over time of not taking the time to call or have lunch together. But somebody you used to work with or used to go to school with or whatever time goes by you get busy but the less conversations and interactions you have with each other the further and further you you grow apart so talk to god today huh talk to god every day we call it prayer it's just talking to god he wants to have that relationship with you he knows your name and now he has told you his name all right so this is a little interesting fact here what's the difference between capital L-O-R-D, all caps, and then the word Lord in your, this is in your English translations, uh, your, your, in your English Bibles, your regular Bibles you have at home, whatever translation it is. Uh, when you see the word with all capital letters, the Hebrew word behind that is actually Yahweh. Hmm, it's a proper name of God. When it's not all capitalized, it's just, it's just Lord, uh, then the Hebrew word there is Adonai, which means Lord or Sir, maybe we would say. Yes, sir. Um, so that's just a little interesting fact there. So when you're reading, uh, especially the Old Testament, a psalm or something, and you come across that all capital letters, Lord, uh, feel free to sail out Yahweh when you're reading that uh, because that's, that's the actual word that's there. All right, so God has given us his name. Uh, number three, God reveals to us his personal name in the New Testament also. And in Matthew 1, we see the, the name given to the Messiah. Uh, Jesus, again, that J, is Latinized. So uh, the Hebrew name, the way his mom would have called him for supper, uh, would have been Yeshua. That's the, again, the Hebrew name for Jesus. And it means Yah, as in Yahweh, and Shua means save, 
God saves. So God has revealed his name to us and he's revealed his character to us. Uh, he saves, he loves, he wants to come and rescue us. Uh, all right, uh, and the fourth point here on the name of God, uh, God also reveals more clearly to us the fullness of who he is. Uh, now we're getting into uh, a little talk on the Trinity here. Uh, so first of all, we know that God is one. It's first blank there on page 13. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is uno, one, ein. Uh, and yet, God is three. Matthew 28, right? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it is with this God who is one God and yet three persons who creates, redeems, and uh, makes us holy. So number four, our God is triune, and we call this the Holy Trinity. Now, when we talk about a triune God, when we talk about the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you look under lesson 11, there's a little chart there, like a triangle, these four circles, and this is a very old diagram. Uh, Theologians, you know, church fathers centuries ago uh, came up with this illustration to try to try to help explain something that's really difficult, obviously, uh, to comprehend. Uh, but basically, you can see that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet the Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Uh, one God, three persons. Now, we can talk about uh, what that looks like uh, up in heaven. Uh, how does the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit interact? How is that relationship like? But all we have is speculation. So we, there's nothing in Scripture that clearly defines how they relate to each other. We're be like trying to peer into um, something infinite and, and certainly incomprehensible to a human mind. So at this point, a lot of people say, well, that's the Trinity, uh, let's move on. Can't understand it, we just accept it at face value. It's what God word, you know, God's word reveals to us. Uh, and it's possible to understand, so don't worry about it. But I would say there is something uh, God does show us about how he relates to us, how he, how he works in the world. Uh, by what he's revealed to us in, in Scripture. The way that we see the Trinity, I should say the triune God, acting in our world and even in each of our hearts. And so uh, the next little chart there, you can see uh, if you're looking at your workbook, uh, you need to draw in some arrows pointing down uh, to uh, talk about how God the Father sent the Son, Luke 20, verse 13. And then in John 15 and Luke 24, we hear Jesus saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit arrives on Pentecost. And what does the Holy Spirit do when, when he arrives? He talks about Jesus, right? The Peter's first sermon. Uh, this is Christ, Jesus whom you killed, God raised from the dead, right? This is the gospel. So the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. And then Jesus, John 14, says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you can, it's very clear uh, how the, the triune God works in the world. The Father, who created all things, right? Sin separated us from God. We can't save ourselves. We can't follow the law perfect uh, to make it on our own. Uh, so he sends the Son to accomplish our salvation. He, he lives a perfect life. He takes the penalty for our death, ascends into heaven, and then he sends the Holy Spirit to give the gift of faith in our hearts and the power to share that gospel, share that faith uh, with others. And that faith is in Jesus Christ. All right, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And now we have faith in Christ. Christ is the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me, he said. Uh, so you, see, you can see how the Trinity works inside. Even though we don't understand how it relates to each other, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity before the world was created, forever afterwards. I don't, humans can't understand that. But I think it is really important for us to recognize how God is working in our own lives, how God works in the rest of the world uh, to bring the good news and bring salvation to each and every person. And there you see it. Maybe one note on the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, we don't put a lot of emphasis on uh, maybe excitement or pizzazz or big show uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, because uh, when the Holy Spirit first arrived on the scene, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit didn't say, oh, look at me, look at all these neat tricks I can do. No, the Holy Spirit came and said, look at Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through him, right? Look to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Look to Jesus who died for your sins, rose from the dead for your eternal life. Uh, so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's to point people to Jesus. So now we have the little understanding of the work that our triune God is always doing, always accomplishing in the world. Uh, let's go to lesson 12 and talk about uh, this triune God that we confess when we say the Apostles' Creed.